All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited. Um, I was a little bit curious. If everybody would please indulge me, can I get a hands up for anyone who's been to a Fountainhead Rhode Island event before? Okay. Definitely some repeat offenders. How about some newcomers? All right. It's about 50-50. I love that. Very exciting. Well, welcome to our usuals and welcome to our newbies. Um, just to kind of kick us off, guys, again, welcome everybody for joining us for our panel discussion and networking event on top risks and opportunities for future generations. As you guys know, because you signed up on our registration page, <laughs> our topics today are really going to focus on housing, cost of living, um, food insecurity, and climate change. Now, for those of you who don't know me, again, my name is Cassandra McGlone, right here on my name tag. I have been a member of the board of Fountainhead Rhode Island since 2020, happily. Um, and when I'm not participating with Fountainhead Rhode Island, I run a little office right in downtown Providence called Insperity with a team, and we partner with small and mid-sized businesses as an HR partner. So hopefully, if I don't see you here, I'll see you out there in another form, but that is me. Um, specifically for our newcomers, I do want to give you guys a little insight on Fountainhead, Rhode Island. So we were born from the idea of creating a welcoming environment of engaged network of business community leaders, whereby diverse people from various backgrounds with even opposing opinions can sometimes share their ideas in an open mind, with open mind and in a safe space, right? Even when those ideas can be challenging topics. So in the spirit of our organization, um, all panelists here and our moderator come today as educators. And we ask that all of you here today attending as our audience attend respectfully and with an open mind as well. And to give you a little further background on Fountainhead Rhode Island, just want to let you guys know. So we host educational panel events like this twice a year. And then we host one large year-end event um, in December. And it's very big. It's an awesome event. I recommend you please check us out. Come join us. Um, but we do this in part thanks to our sponsors, who I do want to recognize. So first and foremost, our gold sponsor, United Natural Foods, and our bronze sponsors, which are both the Washington Trust Company and Bank Newport. So thank you, sponsors, for helping us keep Fountainhead Rhode Island moving and keep these awesome events going. So thank you. Thank you. So without further ado, guys, you may recognize these faces with their impressive bios posted on our registration page, but I'd like to briefly introduce them to you once again. And as I do, please help me in giving them a warm welcome. So I have these in a different order, so I'm going to actually go in order as they're seated for your pleasure or for your convenience. <laughs> so I'll start with Timothy Shartner or Tim Shartner, Chief Visionary Officer of Rhode Island Grows LLC. Rhode Island Girls LLC is actually a fifth generation farming operation spanning three states. Tim has numerous awards. Um, I'm sorry, Tim has numerous national marketing awards and international product development awards and is passionate about ecologically sustainable wealth creation in Rhode Island. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Sitting right next to him is Dina Reitman from DLA Piper. And Dina has over 20 years of experience working in commodity markets, and her background encompasses legal, regulatory, and business experience in commodities with a particular focus in sustainability. Thank you, Dina. You're to her right, we have Representative Stephen Casey, Chairman House of Municipal Government and Housing Committee, former Chair of Health and Human Services Committee, as well as a member of House Corporations Committee, the House Labor Committee. House Special Legislation Committee, and House Veteran Affairs Committee. Thank you, Representative Stephen Casey. And last but absolutely not least, our moderator of the event, Courtney Kelly Bedard. And Courtney has an extensive background in mental health, life coaching, motivational speaking, and entertainment, which is probably where you know her best from. Um, in addition to co-hosting Cat Country Mornings on 98.1, she is also a licensed mental health counselor and runs her own practice in Warwick. So thank you, Courtney. With that said, guys, I will pass the mic off. Thank you so much for joining us, and let's have a great event. Thank you so much. 
And thank you everyone for being here. I'm very excited to be here. I'm a little nervous though, I'm telling you. It's my first time moderating, so we'll see how I do. Um, but yes, welcome everyone. This is gonna be a really great panel. I'm very, very excited. So yes, according to the recent World Economic Forum Global Risk Report they released, there were three key uh, risks that for current and for future generations. And so it was housing and cost of living, um, also climate change and food insecurity. And so we have these uh, experts up here on our panel that we're gonna talk about that. And I think also it would be good to, I'll start off with some questions, but then maybe we can see how each one relates to the other. Maybe just have some conversation around that. Um, but maybe first we can start with Tim and talk a little bit, <laughs> you're on the spot, here we go. <laughs> um, talk a little bit about some background on food production in Rhode Island and what percent we consume is currently produced locally. Um, and I know you have some changes for that as far as producing more locally. Testing, yes, okay. <laughs> it didn't work a moment ago, so. <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, what, we pr what we produce locally, uh, well, we consume about $2.5 billion per year in the state in agricultural products. We produce about 1.6% of it, which is um, not too good. But we have a, a solution. Uh, we have a, uh, a company that we just started on our uh, farm, Shartner Farms in uh, South County. Uh, this will be the fifth interim, fifth change of that farm since we've uh, bought it. It was a dairy and a truck farm. And then it, what we grew uh, for Frito-Lay. And, and then we were, had a roadside market, and we were mostly retail. And some of you might remember that. And now we're going into what's called CEA, which is Controlled Environment Agriculture. And Controlled Environment Agriculture is basically a covered field with glass that has monitors and sensors and computers. And, and it utilizes state-of-the-art technology to determine outcomes. And that is what makes it so great. Inside a 25-acre greenhouse that we're building presently, uh, we could produce about 35 times, so about 1,000 acres per year. And um, so this is one greenhouse. It'll double our produce production in the state with just one. Uh, we have a plan to build 300. 50 acres under glass in our present contract. The state needs about 1,000 acres uh, to bring it so it has a local nutritional inventory of at least 50% of what, it, what we consume. And uh, we need to look at this. We need to look at food security uh, like, it's, like we're a nation. You know, right? We have to, you know, that's a, a big, I think, a big responsibility for us. For the farmers that remain, while we have the acumen still in the, in the state, while we have the fertile lands, and we really have the leaders right now that are focused on this, so I think we could, we could get this done if we pull it together. That's, yeah, that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it is amazing, yeah. but that's not all you're doing. Right. It's true. <laughs> you got to tell them what you told me. Again? You got to tell them what you told me. Okay, so... <laughs> this is super cool. I mean, he's right. being modest. Like, tell him what you told I'll me. Peel, we'll peel the onion a little bit. Yeah, further. let's go. Okay. So, the greenhouse, every single day, is July 27th. That's an average, right? So, the length of day, the CO2 levels, you know, the, pretty much the whole... The plant says, oh, it's time to procreate, and it throws a scapula of fruit and two leaves every week. We do this with lighting. We have 11,000 lights, and we power them with generators. The generators use natural gas off the street. And those, uh, so what happens is uh, the generators produce X amount of heat. So instead of our boilers heating the greenhouse, the generators for the lighting, all right, actually produce enough heat for the greenhouse, so it's a value added. Now, the reason why we need the lights isn't to emulate the sun. That would be a $400 tomato. Uh, this is just to keep the length of day so the plant doesn't go dormant, right? But it still gives us enough heat energy to heat the greenhouse completely. What's even more uh, remarkable is there's a little extra heat, 
And so that heat energy, instead of going to a heat destroyer, which would be typical, is going to help generate uh, and charge super packs, lithium batteries, to charge the EV trucks that are going to handle the logistics. So as a value added, our delivery will be carbon free. Wow. Right? <laughs> On top of that. There's more. <laughs> our emissions, instead of going, well, they go through a, a reburner like every, everything, burn out the organics. But instead of going through an SCR and getting captured in a, uh, like rhodium or palladium, rare earth mineral, we uh, throw it through a radiator, we chill it, and then we compress it. And then we emit it to each plant, 160,000 plants, and they love it. And they scrub the carbon out, and we emit more oxygen per square meter than the average forest in Exeter. This brings us, without delivering every, anything and offsetting what's coming in 21 uh, days away and driving the whole way from Mexico, 6,000 cars off the road. Bring in the town carbon neutral, residentially and with the POVs. That's amazing. When we add what we're offsetting in products coming from Mexico, when we bring it to market, it'll double that, right? So this is, you know, it's essential. Yeah. Right? It's the right path. And uh, it's really, as, as, we, as we developed it and we looked at it, we, it just kept getting better. The onion just kept peeling. And just the story kept getting better. And then we were approached by the state because we have all this biomass, soft tissue biomass, because when you harvest every single uh, day, you're taking a scaffold of fruit, you're taking the branches, you're taking the leaves and the soft tissue, right? And it's putting it into, into a, 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 like a, a, a cart. And that's going to go to a biodigester. The, the state's going to give us a, 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 a plant I mean, a fish waste byproduct from the fishing industry because they want to crank the fishing industry up. So we're putting the get substrate together. So we'll be producing our own biogas. That'll go next door to where the uh, natural uh, gas plant is. And so we'll be drawing off the street a percentage of biogas. This will further uh, lower our carbon footprint. Wow. And we'll probably be 20 some odd thousand cars off the road. One greenhouse. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and Deanna, speak to that too, because that's amazing. She's here to speak on on climate change. Thank you. But You're welcome. Oh my goodness. He was threw being me modest. A softball. <laughs> she threw me a softball. He was being modest. But I met him before we walked in, and so I am a commodities lawyer. And I happen to say that I use my legal skills for good, because for the past 25 years, I've been in commodities and commodities for the most part, are agricultural products, energy products, everything but onions. We will not be growing onions, sir, because they are not a commodity. So I was telling Tim that we could monetize that carbon emission reduction if we monetize that carbon emission reduction, which is a topic near and dear to Jason's heart. We can get money for Tim, and we can scale much faster growing his greenhouse. I don't, I don't hate that. Yeah, I don't hate that. I don't hate that. So that's what I do for um, a living as a commodities lawyer. I figure out how to create the carbon asset. So unlike other commodities that grow from the ground, or um, you know, like rice and beans and things like that, when we're talking about carbon and the creation of a carbon asset, we actually have to create the asset. So with all this technology that you have, we can monitor and we can quantify the amount of carbon or even the amount of methane, because I haven't quite dug into the chemistry here, that we are taking out of the air and or reducing. And we put that into a mathematical equation and we squeeze it and we make it a carbon dioxide equivalent. And every time you have one metric ton of a carbon dioxide equivalent that you reduce or remove from the air, you have an asset, a carbon asset. That carbon asset is needed and wanted by the market. It's wanted by many, by those who simply want it because they want to be carbon neutral. It's it's also wanted and needed by those that need to have it, because there are some industries and some commercial type businesses that need these carbon equivalent reductions to consume or retire, and then it offsets the carbon that they are producing and putting in the air. 
And so that right there, the supply and the demand, gives us an opportunity to finance more of his projects because they're willing to buy them now based upon the technology he has and based upon how we can create the asset. And that's how that would work. That's awesome. Cool. We we're got leaving, networking we're going together. on right Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're leaving together. We're going to change. I love it. <laughs> That's Sorry. Awesome. And you can get in here too. And thank you so much for explaining that because yeah. I was going to ask you to. Oh, no, <laughs> I, was like, I was reading all about it and I would go, I don't quite understand, but thank you so much for explaining that. Yeah, no yeah, problem. Carbon assets. So that's awesome. So that's amazing. And so kind of, you know, going off of that too, it's, you know, thinking about it, like we're talking about the three risks with the food insecurity that can also go into the housing insecurity. And I want to bring you into the conversation too, Stephen Casey. Um, there's a lot of things to speak on this, and I know as, as a representative, you've had to deal with this, with, you know, with housing and people of need, um, and you know, what are you thinking is going on for Rhode Island right now as far as some things that are moving it forward? I know there was just um, funding I just saw come through. It was a $100 million funding, I believe, that came through. Um, so how does this kind of open up and help with housing uh, more secure, to make it more secure? The majority of the money that came through for housing is for projects that were already in existence uh, that were held up by COVID. Oh, okay. Um, so there were uh, probably, I think it was anywhere from 15 to, 20, 15 to 20 different projects that were held up by COVID. But I just wanted to go back. I don't know if any of you guys are as old as I am, but uh, there was a movie called Night Shift. I don't know if you remember it. Henry oh, yeah. Winkler and another guy. <laughs> okay. This guy is getting the tuna fish to eat the mayonnaise. This is like the perfect scenario where you're solving a problem all at once. Um, I, I think what you're doing is great. I want to come and see what you're doing. Well, you're invited. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's my analogy. But regarding housing, food insecurity, um, there, the problem with the problem with the state of Rhode Island, and uh, this may not apply to everybody that's here, but anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of Rhode Islanders are three to six months away from being unhoused if they have an accident or if they have a major uh, issue. Um, people are living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. Uh, it's, a real, it's a real problem. Uh, I work at my, my profession. I'm a fireman in the city of Woonsocket. I see how people live. I understand uh, what it is. I see it every day. Um, and there are many things that happen mental health-wise, that cause homelessness. Food insecurity can cause homelessness. Think, think if you're a, a family, you're a mother and father of four children, and your major concern is trying to keep your job or trying to find an additional job, to, and you, you have to do take care of babysitting, health care. You want to try to have your own, uh, you want to be independent, but it's almost as if you can't. You don't make enough money. And the mental stress on that for, for people, um, that is one of the major causes um, of homelessness. So we have, uh, there's a myriad of issues that cause homelessness, and I've seen it having been on the Health and Human Services Committee during the pandemic. Um, and mental health is a huge issue. We have, we have a, a pandemic of substance abuse disorder in Rhode Island. Um, we have a, a very large number of opioid deaths, um, and the problem is that the, the deaths are recorded, but the number of opioid overdoses that actually take place are not. Um, and as a, as a rescue personnel and a frontline medical worker, um, we see it every day, especially in your, your larger municipalities, but uh, don't be mistaken, the substance abuse disorder issue is it's nonpartisan. It is non-economically driven. People who have great jobs and make $100,000 a year have these problems. Addiction is, it's a disease, it's a problem. And these are the things that we need to address to create a less dangerous environment for everybody in Rhode Island. So there's a lot that goes on that goes into the what causes homelessness. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering all your yeah. questions, but I, I can talk for a couple hours. Yeah. And stuff. 
Well, I was going to say, too, that I worked at the Providence Center for about 15 years, and I was doing case management, and then I did therapy. And, you know, the thing is, when you go back to the hierarchy of needs, if you're not helping to take care of people, they come in, they need housing, they need food. It's, you know, looking for those resources um, before you can start working on other things with them, um, with the mental health issues and that kind of thing. So it was really, really challenging. And I'm sure, like you said, you see that population, but you also see other people who are touched by a lot of different things that, on the appearance, it looks like everything's going well, but like you said, they're not too far away from, you know, something could, that could be catastrophic. Yeah, and I, and I think what it is, if you're an individual who's experiencing these problems or the, you're just, you're so concerned and consumed with taking care of your own family mm -hmm. and to know that if you have an accident or if you break your leg and can't work, mm -hmm. then the entire existence of your family is going to be in jeopardy. Right. And and that's enough mental stress, as, as mm -hmm. you would know, to yeah. to push people over the edge. Right. And, and uh, it's that is a real serious problem. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I was driving the rescue, you know, working probably this is about three months ago, and I responded to an automobile accident. And the gentleman had, was laying outside his vehicle. He obviously had a broken leg with a deformity. Um, he was more concerned about the fact that he had just got back on his feet, just got an apartment, was working as, a, as an electrician, and he, he w was not going to be able to handle being in the hospital, possibly losing his job again, and then trying to start all over it. I apologize for being uh, emotional about it, but I was trying to console him mentally and not even worry about his injury because he wasn't worried about it either. He was so focused on, I'm going to lose everything again, and I'm done. I don't want to do it anymore. I apologize, but that's what, that's what is driving the problems in the state. So, I'm sorry about that. No, no, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. It and the thing is, you do the work that you do, I mean just to be able to be right there with the person and consoling them and, and, and helping them, I mean, that's a beautiful thing because at that time of need, they're gonna remember that, you know? Those are the stories that I hear on the other side of the people that, that touch them, you know? That help to give them that encouragement and to help them to get through. And so it's the first responders, so I give you, you know, kudos to you, that's day in, day out to deal with that. It's really, really heartbreaking, really, really hard. So, but yeah, so we're, we're dealing with, there's, there's so many issues that, you know, we're trying to kind of give some education, some background on all of these issues, but it's also, you know, it's, it's difficult for people now, and we're also looking at future generations. We're trying to, oh, to help to, to give them, you know, some hope out there and, and kind of educate the educators too, like you were saying, about substance use and about mental health, um, you know. I, th I think that there's a, there's a problem with, uh, you know, some people were, will refer to these people as those people. Those people have a problem. Those people, you know, they want something for free. They, they're, they're an expense to the state. Um, you can't address mental health problems like that. Um, you, you just can't do it. We, there's a human element. People go, th you know, some people are less fortunate. Um, I'm fortunate that I, I have a, a good support system. My, my friends on the fire department, we see this every day. We talk about it. Um, we mentally walk through things. We've responded to a lot of horrible, absolutely horrible incidents. Um, so we deal with that in our own way. But if, if there's a person who is trying to just run their family and can't, can't get the counseling that they need or don't know where to turn, uh, it, it, it's going to turn people upside down. Yeah, it is. It's very difficult. And we also, sometimes we take it for granted. You know, we have, if we have healthy families around us, they can help us through things. But a lot of the people that are having struggles, they, there's generational issues too. Um, and it can be very, very difficult. So, um, so again, we thank you for, you know, for being there for people too, because it's, it can be very, very painful, but it's very, very meaningful too. So, so yeah, so there's a lot of layers to it, and I think that's the thing, too, with food insecurity and with the housing and with climate change. I was actually even reading an article about people getting more, um, having mental health issues about climate change. I was just thinking yeah. that. I was I, thinking that about how, what I'm yeah. talking about. Right. 
how that release. probably causes so much stress mm-hmm. for people who are really just trying to feed their family. Yeah. And I'm sitting here talking about something that's probably creating more of an expense, although you figured something out, which I thought was great, mm-hmm. because until I met you, when you are buying and selling carbon, you're creating something that is a luxury buy. And when you're putting that pressure on people on top of just having to just buy the food or have right. food that's less expensive mm-hmm. because we want to put some tax on it or something for a carbon neutral, it is really a luxury buy. It's causing stress. I, I Literally, you took the words out of my mouth. Well, it's, it's, it was funny because when I read the article, it was called Eco um, Anxiety mm-hmm. and about you know, all the climate change and the things like around here, like when we heard about the, the fires that were going on and like all of the different things people are getting stressed out about. Um, and they said that you can look up a therapist that can specifically work with you on like, you know, calming about the environment and stuff. And, and I said, this is so interesting. I haven't come across that in my practice, the people, you know, in that, to, to that degree, but I can see where that could go in that direction. Right. Yeah. So there has to be an answer to this. Somehow we have to be able to turn this, um, almost like you did from a luxury yeah. buy, from an expense to something that can help save money because you figure out a way to create and generate heat mm-hmm. using fish. That's got to be cheaper than buying natural gas because it's fish waste. There has to be an answer to marry these two things together. You know, there's hope. Yeah. And uh, I think a a big part of uh, the future is going to be uh, the work culture and setting expectations. I I do think that... uh, the struggle and, and the reward and, you know, and the depression. And depression is really just not being able to formulate a future in your mind, right? When you, and you fall depressed. And I think that a lot of times we, we're watching TV and we get our expectations set for us. And the truth is, is that, you know, there's a saying, you don't work for bread alone, which is, you know, tender or money. You also work for two other things, a sense of self-accomplishment and recognition from those we care about. And those three things are the tenets of purpose. And the truth is, is that I don't think we foster that in our workforce well enough. It's not trained to supervisors. It's not, people aren't getting, their, their expectations are set by MTV Cribs. Those people are out of those houses by the time that episode airs. And we're all struggling with, you know, not being happy, right? And then we fall to, uh, you know, uh, drug use, you know, alcohol, and the things that cause us to compromise, all right, our livelihoods, and we end up on the street. And it's not them and they, it's us. It's all just, it's just all us. And uh, I think, I do think that there's a bright future coming. I know what we're doing with our cult work culture is, you know, my guys, they only work half a year, right? They don't work in the winter. Well, in this greenhouse, they're going to have gainful employment with the benefits. You know, that's a, that's, that breaks the status quo. And then when they reach their, their uh, incentives and their goals, right, they'll be getting phantom units, right? Now, that's something that the C-suite, the CEOs, the COFOs, that's what they get, these guys that are out in the field, me, I, I work that field night and day. I know who's making it happen. All of a sudden, in the, in the canteen, which is part of the inside the greenhouse, inside the clean room, on the, on the screens on the wall, which has what's up and coming, safety, it'll say sale. And they can go on their, on their phone to the employee app, and they can hedge, they can sell, right? They're learning about financial responsibility. We're teaching them the fundamentals of interest. We're going to be teaching them a lot about the predatory businesses like the cash, uh, check cashing, right? And the banks are helping me, right? It's a whole community effort. URI is setting up a curriculum for them. Their training will give them a college credit, an associate's degree in plant sciences and CEA sciences. So there are efforts to change the culture, right? Because when you talked about the guy, when you said your story, it punched me in the stomach. I had to wipe my eyes, right? 
but he, if we're if, if it's a healthier environment and a better culture, there's a lot less of that outcome, right? And so I think that it's you know I'm trying to promote. I'm a capitalist, right? I don't believe in socialism. Okay, I'm going to say it now. I believe in conscientious capitalism. Okay, I know that capitalism can can lead itself to greed. But let me tell you, socialism, all right, it's great for binary constructs, ants, you know, and sheep. But anybody telling you to be a sheep is a wolf, all right? And that's just the way it is. But if we can take this great tool called capitalism and we can manage it, all right, we can be compassionate with it, it's an incredible thing. And then all the social programs, not socialism, but social programs that we love, that help everybody, they live off the fat of that machine, right? You can't shut the machine off, right? So we got to start, it's, it's our, you know, we're here, I'm 55, right? We're, we're here, you know, I'm always looking to my dad, like, what are we going to do, you know? I'm like, oh, wait, it's me. What am I going to do? What am I going to foster? What am I going to leave to my kids, right, and to my, and my employees? And... Uh, I'm interested in, in determining better outcomes. So, and I think what you're talking about falls right in line with developing a great culture, you know, setting expectations. Happiness happens. That's why it's happy, hap, right? You got to be, you got to have a sense of purpose, two feet on the ground, and then all of a sudden you'll be immersed in it. You can't chase it. So that's how I feel about yeah. that. I love that, yeah. It's talking about the compassion, and also I love how you were talking about education, you know, having that edu education component too. And I was just thinking too, of kind of redefining work sometimes as well, because I've had a lot of clients who have mental health issues, they want to go to work, but the 40-hour work week, the way that it has to be, the, you know, certain ways it's defined um, with no flexibility makes it really difficult, all or nothing. And then they're, you know, they're on disability and they don't want to be. They want to maybe work part-time. They want to get out there because it's great for your self-esteem too. Right. And you feel connected. You feel part of a right. community. And so I think there's being, there's a lot of reforms around that as well in agencies that people are trying to, you know, they're, they're having incentives for places to have jobs for people, to have more of that flexibility so they can be part of that. Um, and I think that's part of it too, that we need to help with the housing insecurity and with the food insecurity. Yeah. So, so with all of this, is there, do you think of certain things like maybe resources or something that, you know, if somebody wants to take this with them, something from, from today, you know, something that they can take with them as far as, like you said, we're kind of fostering some hope here as well. We're discussing the issues, but there's also a lot of hope for the future. Um, maybe a resource or something that people can do that would be you know, something on a practical end, you know, uh, for, for something that they can look into if they want to move forward on any of these? Well, I mean, there's a lot of um, uh, public-private um, startups. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that they're all mired in uh, what we're discussing today, right? I mean, you, we pick these topics because it, they're the hot topics, right? And, uh, you know, people being uh, one uh, paycheck away from a uh, destitute, you know, with four kids or three kids, it's, uh, that is a constant stress, right? And uh, I think that, um, you know, what we need to do is we need to look at what we're interested in, what's in our lane, what we think we could spend a little time on, right? And find that specific uh, organization or opportunity or volunteerism, right? And, and deploy yourself. If you want to make a change, be the change. You know, that's, yeah. that's the only thing we can do. You can't hope. Hope's for Sunday. I do it every Sunday. But, you know, all of the six days, we determine things, right? So I think that, you know, the answer is follow your heart and then take action. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, not just resources. But remember, I started this whole thing by saying for 25 years I was in commodities and I'm finally using what I have done 
for something good. Like I feel alive. So even if you don't need resources and you're just a plain old simple lawyer like I am and you grew up in commodities and you had no idea that one day you'd be able to use this skill for good, that everybody and everybody sitting out here today can use whatever it is they're doing to do something good. And I tell you that I am on a speaking circuit and I believe in the fact that the market, this market, this carbon market, if we do set it up, to be based on capitalism, we can create food. And we can create housing. We can do it. I agree. We can do it. I agree. I, th I think you're kind of looking for takeaways. Um, every one of us went through COVID, but all of us went through COVID in a different way. I was a first responder. I didn't have an opportunity. I had to get a shot. I had to go to work, keep my job. Um, some people were allowed to work at home. So we had a, basically a complete redesign of how, how, our, how our lives function, how, how work functions. If anybody is familiar with the area, Citizens Bank built, built an incredible campus in Johnston, and the place was empty for two years because everybody started working from home. Uh, it's, it's a new model. It's a different way of doing things. But mentally and emotionally, COVID kicked the crap out of all of us in, in different ways. Every one of us experienced it. My mom and my mother-in-law were in nursing homes. I didn't see them for a year. We couldn't see our parents for a year if you had someone in the nursing home. Uh, parents were worried about kids masking and all of this stuff, and we're being told by everybody that we have to do things a certain way, a new way of changing our lives. So it completely changed everyone's outlook. But I think from a mental standpoint, it changed me. Um, during that time period, my, my brother uh, was diagnosed with brain cancer. So, and he's doing as best he can. But every time I talk to my brother, I say, how are you doing? He says, I'm just trying to stay alive. He's got two kids. So everything that I do doesn't even matter compared to what he's got on his plate. He's worried about his kids. One's graduating this year, his, uh, my niece. And my nephew is graduating next year. Um, he's worried about the, the future for his children. He's trying to get everything done at his house so that, so that they can be, if he leaves, that they can be safe and have a home and, and, and just do the best that they can. So for everyone who experienced COVID, it's different. But for me, like you said, you know, we're trying to find new solutions. Um, for me, I just want to do the best that I can for the rest of the time that I'm here. Uh, for everybody, for my family, for the entire state of Rhode Island. It's, it's, I think COVID has changed the outlook for a lot of people, and I think we need to reach deep down and understand that um, we're all part of something bigger than just ourselves. I think that the Internet and telephones and kids, you know, everybody wants to be an Internet star or whatever it is. Listen, that's not reality, okay? What we have to think about is the whole, the whole of us as a community um, we all need to survive together. Um, you know, I, I'm in politics. People don't agree politically what's happening. And some people will shut off if you don't agree with them politically. I think we need, to, we need to get the humanity back into our human lives and agree to disagree on what we don't agree on, but, but to agree on what we do agree on and build on our strengths and create a, a better community overall. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, and, and I was thinking too with that, not to, very good, yeah, to not insulate yourself with only one opinion of things. And I know sometimes we tend to do that, you know, with social media and different things. Sometimes we just are looking at one opinion rather than, even if we don't agree with other people, just to open up to the, to say, I understand maybe where they're coming from. Because we do seem to have more ways of understanding than not, but yet in this current climate, it makes it very difficult and people are kind of, you know, split one way or the other. So sometimes I listen to things just because I know that I'm not going to agree with that, but just to like practice <laughs> saying, okay, I understand where they're coming from on that. Um, but I think that that's part of it and having the dialogue, having compassion for people for wherever they come from, um, even if we don't fully understand, you know, the things that they've been through, but having that compassion 
Um, and like you were saying, the education, because I think, yeah, during the pandemic, that was, you know, that was, for me, I know it was a unique experience to be counseling my clients through something that I was going through as well. It was very strange because usually either you're not going through the same thing at the same that. time as they are. Yeah. So they were like, you know, there were a lot of people freaking out. Who's going to counsel me? So, <laughs> and I'm trying to be like, it's going to be okay. Meanwhile, in my head, I don't know what's going on either, you know? So it was very unique during that time. I think everybody had a, a, a unique perspective on what was happening. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, taking some of that with us to remember, to keep your heart open, to keep working, to keep looking for that hope in things. Because um, we made it through. And it's amazing. When you look back, you go, Wow. You know, coming home, washing the washing the. Um, used to wash the Dorito bags. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> washing the cereal boxes. I was like throwing it on the porch. I'm like, oh my god, I remember so vividly. Like, oh my god, I think we have to wash all that before we bring it in the house. <laughs> like, <laughs> that only lasted a couple times, and then I was like, oh. <laughs> but yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it, it was. we were we were all doing it. Yeah. yeah. None of or, us talk about it. Did, and everybody's going, <laughs> oh, did you get sick? Oh, it was because you pumped the gas. Did you not wear a glove? Like. Yeah, <laughs> everybody was like, oh my gosh. So, but yeah, but really acknowledging each other that we made it through and that, you know, and, and we're stronger together and looking at those kind of things too. So yeah. We're stronger together. We're stronger together. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, right on cue. The <laughs> it's interesting that, you know, you say you watch both. I, um, I watch both. I watch both sides, yeah. uh, the conservative and the liberal news. And I found that if you only watch what caters to your... Uh, to your agenda, your personal beliefs, uh, you get, it, it's an interesting thing that'll happen if you force yourself to watch both. It won't be a month and you will be, they're, you know, taking away, like subtracting from both sides and find yourself centered and you'll actually be more accurate. And uh, it's a good practice I not actually, to, it's I a good practice that. what you're doing. <laughs> I do that, yeah. Sometimes I get aggravated. I'm I'm listening to certain things, but then I but like you said, it does. Something happens where you start to question both, and then you start to come into a, a middle spot, and you can start to understand why people are where they are. Um, and I think that just helps for you to have more compassion because I know for me with clients, people have all different viewpoints, and I have to be able to hold a space for that. And so you know, and of course I'm going to have my own ideas, but I have to suspend that. You know, so. But yeah, so really interesting, interesting discussion. We're going everywhere. <laughs> We're going everywhere tonight. So, um, but yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> Wait, did you even get to the question? We're here all night. Yeah. What's the second question? I know, right? <laughs> well, the, we were saying like we wanted it to be a, sort of an integrated discussion more than question and answer. So, um, so yeah, I wrote down questions, but we, I think we kind of answered them all too as we're going through it. Yeah. So, um, but really fascinating. And and Tim, just to speak a, a little bit more too, with you were talking about this is for tomatoes. The for the um, for your greenhouse. The first greenhouse is a okay. monocrop. Beef steak tomatoes. Okay. Um, what's interesting is the question that I asked myself on that piece right. of paper. <laughs> that you gave me. Is it tomato, a fruit, or a vegetable? Let's get to that. But Where was that? <laughs> my, you know, someone asked me, said, um, you know, why, you know, why eat local? Is it just economic? Are we just helping our local farmer? And the truth is absolutely not. The truth is actually very vertical and one of the things is the carbon that they burn 21 days trans of logistics to get here uh the other is economic you are all right every time you invest in a local business it has a compounded effect okay to the local economy compared to the global economy and what's interesting also is that um when a tomato is harvested in mexico when the seed becomes viable, it tells the flesh to become viable. Before that, it's, it's toxic. It has lectins. It has all these things that, that makes the insects and the animals not eat it because the seed's not viable yet. It wants to be eaten once it's viable, you know, and pooped out somewhere, right? Or at least to drop with the seed and to nourish the seed. And we're harvesting it. What we eat today, we're harvesting with non-viable flesh. Right? But when we grow folk, uh, locally, the Boston-New York corridor, same day, 47 million miles, all right, we're growing something that comes to nutrition all right, on the vine. It's not a banana, right? So a tomato, it gets all its nutrition and all its flavor 
from staying on the vine and being vine ripened. You can't pull it off. It will turn red. Ethanol will produce ethanol, which is a ripening uh, hormone. It will turn red, but it's not going to eat like what you're used to in, in August. And it's not going to be as nutritious. What we produce in this greenhouse will be 80% more nutritious than what we're presently eating. So wow. economic, carbon, and nutrition. Now, I got a call from Amika, from a gentleman. He asked me about my offtake. I said, well, Master Nutty Produce has 100% of my offtake right now, Sunset brand. You might know Flavor Bombs and all their stuff in the store. I said, but I'm interested. Why, why Mika, you're an insurance company. Why are you interested? You got farm stands on the side? He said, they said, no, actually, our, one of our biggest clients is assisted living. Right? And he said, and their, and their clients, okay, all right, is, uh, you know, if they die playing tennis, God forbid, or after they've been, take, been, been bedridden for four years, the difference in cost is like immeasurable, right? So nutrition and all right is the leading contributor for longevity. So the, they don't look for better drugs, they don't look for better pharmaceuticals, they're not calling Pfizer, they're calling me. And I was dumbfounded. I was like, wow, because I believe in actuaries. All right. Insurance companies know the truth and what actually effectuates change. So this is a big game changer for us. In, in a huge way to actually be able to determine a nutritional inventory locally. It's, it's essential. And I'm going to tell the governor when I talk to him next, we're having to, I have to speak to him. And I'm thinking about what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. And uh, one of the things is, is when it comes to our own energy production and our own food uh, production, we have to think like a nation. And there's just no way around it. And uh, I hope that he'll take that seriously. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. I think you got it right. I, I referred to my brother who has brain cancer. Um, so he's completely changed his diet so that his body can fight cancer and not all the pesticides in our foods. Um, he is completely organic. He has an aquaponic garden in his basement, grows his own lettuce, kale. He has tilapia that their feces feeds the entire system, and it's, it's incredible. But he had been doing that prior to. This is just the way he, he wanted to live. Um, but I haven't had a Coca-Cola since January 20th when he scared the crap out of me about that <laughs> cancer actually loves sugar. And, I, and, yeah. and um, you know, he gave me a book, and I've tried to change my diet slowly. It's very difficult to do, but healthy, healthy eating... Is is incredible. It just turns into better outcomes. It will it will it will save our healthcare system. There are, there are a million different things. We, we have to look at different ways of doing things. And corporate America may not like that because all they sell is sugary drinks to kids and that type of stuff. But um, as parents and 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 teachers and uh, business leaders, you know, we, we have to approach things in a, in a different way. Um, I have some friends on the fire department. You would think these guys are the healthiest guys in the world. One of them is a 175 pounds landscaper. Comes back from the doctor, finds out he's diet, type 2 diabetic just because of his diet. It's not because of he was overweight and doing anything. It's just what he eats. Um, so consciously, people need to really uh, take a look at what they're doing. I want to live forever. Um, it's not going to happen, but, but I want to change the way I do things now seeing what my brother is doing, and like I said, he just wants to live. Um, so diet, diet, diet is huge, um, and I think it will take the burden off some of the health care systems and the problems that we have. Um, just a little piece. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you so much, guys. I truly, truly appreciate everything you've shared with everyone here tonight, the time, all the knowledge. Truly, again, can we give them a round of applause? It's amazing. So I'm so sorry to have to interrupt them right now, but I do want to be respectful of the schedule and everyone's time, and I do want to open it up now to Q&A. So without a further ado, if anybody in the audience, I'll take one, maybe two questions. 
feel free. I know you have a lot going on in your brain. Think about what really interests you, maybe an urgent question you had. See one hand. All right, we're going to come over to you. Hi, guys. Uh, my name's Annie. Thank you for being here. This was really um, a lot of really awesome information. So cool to hear about a local farm doing so, so much uh, forward thinking. Um, so just really psyched to be here. Um, one question I have is right at the end, we started talking about access to nutrition being a major determinant in, in public health. Um, but another thing that we should acknowledge is the number of people in Rhode Island who don't have access to healthy food, who are on food stamps, things like that. Um, and so it's, it's all well and good to say, oh, you know, we can go to a farmer's market and get organic tomatoes that are 80% more like, better for your body. Awesome. Um, but how do people actually get those in their kitchens? Um, so one question I have is I've seen a few farmer's markets accepting EBT. Is there an avenue for some kind of continued subsidy with that? Um, just kind of increasing the access to the healthy food? Yeah, well, I'll answer that. Yes. Um, food stamps and WIC or the new WIC uh, is accepted by farms. Uh, that is a, they put that through uh, a while back. Um, do these people have access to uh, get to all the farms? Are they on service roads where the buses go? Um, I, I don't think so. But um, it is, uh, the, the systems in place, is it being utilized? efficiently and is, are people educated to the difference that are afforded that um uh you know that opportunity with WIC and food stamps uh i'm not gonna it's the, it's gonna be someone's job that you know has a name that i don't want to say they don't they haven't done it or have done it but it's something to look into and um uh, i i think that, that an excellent question but to be, but to also answer your question even the richest person, unless they're flying their, their stuff in separately or, or growing it themselves, um, what's available at the market, the most expensive product, isn't, isn't, isn't even comparably nutritious compared to what you have in your garden in the summer. So the, we need to move the whole bar up. Uh, we are working with um, the food bank and with Andy, and we have... Uh, we grow about 19 million pounds a year in this one greenhouse, um, and our shrinkage would be about 3%. So you can figure out what they're already looking at, how they're going to deploy all that produce in a way where it can actually get to miles, because it only has so many days on it, right? So there are, thing, there are things in place that, that are, are, that are um, working on that. But, I mean, that's the best I can answer that question. Oh, I was just going to say one thing. Um, I think it was through the community, the Rhode Island Community Food Bank. I remember when I was at the Providence Center, they had, they were, there was a partnership and they were trying like that. They were trying to get food um, from some of the farmers markets and they were giving incentive to people to, to go there and have it uh, for cheaper. And there was also another program in Pawtucket where people were going around bagging food together and it was, they were, you know, selling it maybe for a couple of dollars, but putting a lot together. So there were certain incentives and there were certain things that they were trying to put together. So, but I would say probably through the community food bank that they may have more information on that, but there was a push. I remember we were trying to get clients involved with that. I think uh, we refer to access. Um, there's, it's very difficult for people from the inner city who may be on food stamps, more, more than likely be on food stamps, who can't get to where they need to go to, to get that, nutri the, that food with such nutritional value. Uh, there, are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of places in, one so in my town in Woonsocket, and I know in Providence, a Community Care Alliance, Thunder Mist, they do actually have farmer's markets um, on a relatively regular basis. Um, but still, it, it's about education. Um, think about it from another perspective. You're on food stamps. You're trying to feed your family. You, you want to get every penny out of that, whatever your benefit is. Um, so, you know, you're shopping at the dollar store for, for you know, macaroni and cheese because you're just trying to get as much as you can for your family, but in the end, they're not getting nutritional value out of that. So we're creating more medical problems. We're creating more 
um, opportunity for kids to have diabetes and to have uh, obesity issues. And then that becomes, it, it goes right into the school system. You're talking about the fat kid at school and it's the bullying. And then it, 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 this is a systemic issue and, and you really need to look at it from a holistic standpoint and how can we provide you know, a, a better way of doing things. Um, one of the problems with government, which I'm part of, is just sometimes we think that there's one problem and we throw money at it and say, this is how we're going to solve this problem. But you have to take that 10,000 foot view and say, what's the real, what's the systemic problem that we're looking at and how do we solve that? And it may take more money, but in the end, if we think about it, if we can solve the problem on a large basis, we're saving money in the end. Um, and I'll give you an example in a minute, but you're saving money in the end on health care costs and mental health issues with children who get bullied at school. Um, I'll give you a quick example. When I was the chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee, Blue Cross Blue Shield is the number one provider for health insurance in Rhode Island. It's almost a, a monopoly. But we started to talk about colorectal cancer screening for everyone for free. And, you know, there were issues. They're like, oh, we can't do that. It's too expensive. Like, what are the costs in the end if we don't catch it? I, I would rather pay the upfront cost all day than have to treat 100 people for cancer and just put them through and their families through all that, the pain and misery. Um, and... Blue Cross, they're looking at those type of things now. We're going to do preventive medicine instead of just worrying about how many people are going to get sick and what's happening. We talk about preventive. And, and if we start from the beginning, food source, we talked about healthy eating. If we can tackle these problems in a holistic way, and I don't even know if I'm using the right term, but we can really do a lot to, to save money in the end for the entire state with Medicaid, Medicare costs, all of these different things that affect the entire country. It's, a, it's just a different way. We, we just have to, like, like you said, peel the onion back and figure out what the real problems are and the root causes. And if we can go back that far, then we're not going to be spending any more money than we are. We're going to save money in the end as far as the state's concerned. We're going to have lower taxes. We're going to be able to do... A million different things and then educate our kids about you know all of all of the things that are the technology and the things we're going to do in the future we're not even talking about what it is now we need we need we need kids to understand that um you know your job is not going to be internet related we need plumbers pipe fitters we need construction workers we're trying to build housing we don't have enough workers there's businesses in Quonset point they can't find enough workers that are skilled i'm talking about trades Kids can come out of high school making $100,000 a year instead of spending 100000 on college. But it's just a different way of, it's different way of thinking. Great points, everyone. Awesome, awesome. I'm going to take one last question just for time's sake, and I see a hand over here. Thank you so much for... Um, for this event and this uh, just pouring so much knowledge to us and uh, being a resource. So my question is, um, how do we bridge the gap between education and awareness? Because I feel that it starts at a younger age, going into schools, planting the seeds, and teaching kids where their food actually comes from. And then from there, it becomes a ripple effect to their family, to the community, but if we are talking about change and being the change that we envision ourselves to be, it starts earlier on. And I feel that oftentimes we catch on at a later age rather than planting the seed at a younger age. So how do we bridge that gap between connecting farms, com connecting the farmers that are working hard to to put those those resources or to plant those seeds from the roots? up and um and how do we connect the kids to 
what what we're actually doing and not thinking that food are mass produced or food are, are came from just a package but yet it came from a soy we had to plant the seed we had to grow it and connect them back to their roots um so how do we bridge that gap well that's a great question and i think that um it starts organically gr grassroots and i think it's in place but i think um, there is a there's a um, there's a barrier. So let's just talk about that for a second. So school tours or you know f you know field trips to farms, right? Uh, with a module that's built in at the teacher's store. So you can buy the module. You do some part of the module before the trip, and you go on the trip, and then the back. You when you get back, you follow up and you finish it. We had that for 40 years at our farm. And we have the module. Uh, we're, take, we, we're not currently that since the fire. We have uh, uh, suspended that. We will turn it on again. But it was the schools instigated the trip. So we got a. It was mostly uh, urban, suburbia. It was not that much. Not city uh, kids. You know they looked. You know, under plastic at those supermarkets, said that's where food comes from, right? I think that if we re, if we reinvigorate that same program with the modules, and then the state, there is some uh, either incentive or it's compulsory that you have to pick some agricultural uh, field trips in certain grades. So they're exposed to that, and they bring it back with them. We used to give them Jiffy 7s with the seeds. They go back to the school, and they get a pumpkin. Uh, this is, uh, it's essential. But we're, the, what we're, was missing is we were waiting for them to come to us. You know, we had, a, we had a, lot of, a lot of schools do it. We had 10,000, our busiest was 10,000 kids in a year. But it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't equal. Not everywhere, you know, came and uh you know so i think that making it free probably you know would be and put it in the marketing budget and say oh these kids are going to shop here one day could be you know that could be actually a solution right but it's going to think outside of the box thinking to really determine what you what you're talking about and i think it's an excellent an excellent thing to to develop I, I would have to agree. I, I think that um, there's a lot to be said for public-private partnerships and, and things like this. Um, to send a kid on a field trip, I, I just, uh, you know, I'm going to go back to the Quonset thing. I, I recently toured a, uh, a company that uh, works out of Quonset. This company is going to be servicing the 300 windmills that we're going to build as a wind farm. Um, they're building boats and they're building shuttles for personnel. And they're also building, um, they're also having an opportunity to have dry docks so that we can actually service the, the, the windmills that are there. Um, they need a pier rebuilt. But this guy is short 20 people, 20 welders. Um, he's, he's behind in production, but they're working as best they can to do it. And I'm talking about, like you say, field trips. You take a kid who's in seventh grade who doesn't, want to burden his parents with, or his or her parents with college tuition because they know what, kids know what their economic status is. Let's not fool each other, okay? Kids know if they're poor. But when you give a kid an opportunity to see and say, listen, if you go to trade school and you learn how to weld, when you're 18, you can come and work for this company and you can work all day long you can work all week long. There's going to be overtime. This particular business is going to last because it's the only one in the Northeast that is going to provide service for the 300 windmills that we're going to have offshore. And when you give a kid an opportunity like that and they see, I, I want to go there and learn how to weld. I want to, I want to build one of these boats. I'm, that's just kind of the way that I am. But when you give a kid an opportunity and there's a light at the end of the tunnel, an inspired child can do anything if you let them believe they can do anything. So I think that that is the key, and we're talking about d different things. You know, kids might want to come and learn to be a farmer. Um, there's a million different opportunities for that, um, and I, but I think 
more importantly, with our education system, is parental involvement. Um, we always hear about how, how the school doesn't teach the kids enough and this and that. Everything starts at home. Um, you know, I don't have children, but I have 56 nieces and nephews. So I have come from a very large family. But Christmas is a real pain in the butt. But I'll tell you that, um, yeah, you know, kids who are inspired believe they can do anything. And when you, when you just encourage people, and it all, like I said, it all happens at home. Some of the issues that we have are systemic. Kids are having kids. You know, you got eight kids coming out of high school having children, um, not, and, and they're not even adults yet. And they're trying to raise the kids, and they never get to that point where they understand that they need to, they need to be able to encourage these people. We, we have a lot of different things we need, we need to work on, but it's about family and parental involvement. We have broken homes. These are some of the things that, you know, a lot of people don't experience. And I'm going to say, it's like, you, we all make the mistake of sometimes saying, those people, they're not doing enough this night. It's all about, it's all about believing what you can do. Um, and, and for people to have the resources to do what they need to do. You, you, you know, you need people who are behind you who work in mental health and social services to be able to say, you can do this. And I think that's, that's where it starts. And when you have parents that can encourage children to believe that they can do anything, then you can't. And, and, and I think we've lost part of that family unit, and that's, that's affecting the children of today as well. So, it, like I said, there's a, there's a big helicopter view that we need to take of, of, of what is really affecting our children. And they are our children because if we don't take care of what we have, then they're going to be our responsibility in the end in, in one way or another. So I think that's a holistic view of everything. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, guys. Well, again, like I said, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Can we please give everybody a round of applause for our panelists here? Thank you, Tim Sharkner. Thank you, Dina Reitman. Thank you, Representative Stephen Casey. Thank you very much, Courtney Kelly Bedard. Again, this has been a very engaging conversation, guys. If you enjoyed it, thank you so much for coming. Um, we do want to open up to our social part of our event so you guys can engage in your interesting conversations or perhaps continue picking our panelists and moderators' brain. Um, but before we do that, I do want to let you know if you enjoyed this topic today, we do have one upcoming on September 26th. It's going to be on leadership and culture in the workplace. It's a Tuesday, and it's actually going to be held right here in the Guild. So if you are interested or if you think you know someone who's interested, the QR code is right over there in the registration desk when you walked in. Please go ahead, scan it, share it with your friends, families, coworkers, friends, dogs, whoever you want. I don't care. Invite everybody. We welcome everybody here. As you know, these events are free. Thank you to our sponsors, who I do want to re-mention. Our gold sponsor, United Natural Foods. Thank you very much. And our bronze sponsors, the Washington Trust and Bank Newport. Thank you to them as well. Without further ado, guys, please go ahead, get your refills, have some great conversations, and come again. Thank you very much. And thank you again, guys. Appreciate it.